Hello everyone, um, this is lesson 26 um, in which we are going to read Suetonius' Life of Augustus uh, uh, together. And so in fact uh, there is no formal handout for today but instead I would like you to uh, use uh, uh, the internet uh, resource uh, the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, which is indicated on uh, the syllabus and for which I will also uh, uh, provide uh, uh, a link. Um, so this is uh, Suetonius, The Lives of the Caesars, which is a larger work of which the life of Augustus we are reading together um, uh, today. So um, to start, um, uh, let us uh, uh, look at this uh, slide. So we are talking about uh, the life of Augustus. And uh, the first thing we are going to do is to compare uh, Suetonius's life to Augustus's Res Gestae. And you might recall from the last class that the Res Gestae was uh, published in 14 uh, CE and is a very programmatic uh, first person summary that Augustus himself uh, wrote and wanted published on his uh, funerary monument. Uh, in contrast, Suetonius's life of Augustus, uh, just like the life of Caesar uh, that we have already looked at, was written almost a hundred years later uh, by someone who is essentially an imperial administrator. And uh, uh, he, we know that Suetonius actually had quite a bit of access while he was writing the lives of uh, Caesar and uh, Augustus to various documents preserved uh, from his rule. And therefore, when we make this comparison, in a way, we can test how well Augustus did. You uh, recall that he published uh, the Res Gestae, or if you want to translate on his deeds, uh, widely all around the empire. And we can probably presume that most inhabitants of the empire, uh, that's all they kind of knew about uh, how Augustus uh, ruled. However, it seems that from Suetonius, we can learn a little bit more about the kind of stories going around about Augustus and the kind of ways in which people remembered him, which gives us a little bit of a deeper insight into um, Augustus. So to start, for example, uh, military leadership, as we have uh, established on the basis of the res gestae, was very important for Augustus, and he very much wanted to be uh, presented as a military leader. Uh, we have seen his images in the Prima Porta Augustus, uh, standing with his uh, sort of military outfit. And in fact, in the res gestae, he says, uh, those who assassinated my father, I drove into exile, avenging their crime by due process of law. And afterwards, when they waged war against the state, I conquered them twice on the battlefield. These were the two battles of Philippi in 42 uh, BCE. Now, we already talked about uh, how we uh, have details that we know uh, that, um, you know, in the battles, in those two battles, um, Augustus didn't do so well. And if it hadn't been for Mark Antony, then probably would, he would have not uh, made it. But how do we know that? Uh, so, for example, we know it from, um, uh, from the life of uh, Suetonius, in addition to some other uh, historians who've written uh, in Greek after Suetonius, but Suetonius is a good uh, uh, reasonably close source. So let's see. Suetonius says in the life of Augustus, uh, section 13, you might want to scroll down uh, in your other window uh, to see this. So this is what he says. Then forming a league with Antony and Lepidus, this would be of course the uh, second triumvirate. He finished the war of Philippi also in two battles, although weakened by illness, being driven from his camp in the first battle and barely making his escape by fleeing to Antony's division. So I think what's so striking about this, that even 100 years after Augustus died, which clearly means that there is nobody there who would have been an eyewitness, um, people knew that he was not quite the excellent uh, uh, military commander that he would have uh, liked us to uh, uh, think. And so uh, we get even more sort of anecdotal evidence from Suetonius. And the next section here will give us a little bit of an insight into the kind of stories that got preserved, right? So this is um, uh, maybe not absolutely word by word true, but nevertheless is an interesting way of uh, thinking about Augustus as a person. So after drilling, this is section 16, after drilling his forces there all winter, he defeated Pompey between Milai and Nolocus. Uh, this would be uh, Sextus Pompey. Though just before the battle, he was suddenly held fast by so deep a sleep 
that his friends had to awaken him to give the signal. Ouch. That's a bit of a dig um, insofar as uh, it suggests that he was actually asleep and he had to be woken up to start a battle, which um, gives us all kind of pause. Usually as a general, you want to time your uh, battles to start them at the right time. So if he's sleeping, who is making that decision? Um, at any rate, this is, uh, we find out something more about uh, how this knowledge may have passed down from the time of Augustus uh, to later times. So this is what Suetonio says. And it was this, I think, that gave Antony opportunity for the taunt. He could not even look with steady eyes at the fleet when it was ready for battle, but lay in, in a stupor on his back, looking up at the sky, and didn't rise or appear before the soldiers until the enemy's ships had been put to flight by Marcus Agrippa. So what's really uh, funny about this story is that uh, what we get here is a little bit of an insight that Mark Antony actually also put out quite a bit of significant propaganda against Augustus. And even though we don't have access to the full package of that, uh, uh, um, that oppositional uh, propaganda, clearly some of it stuck. And some of it in this case suggests that uh, maybe Augustus didn't even wake up when the, the battle was about to start, but only after the enemy sh ships have been turned around by his uh, fellow uh, um, in uh, uh, that battle, and that is uh, Marcus Agrippa. So, uh, uh, and in a final sort of characteristic uh, uh, depiction, uh, we can end this section 16 by reading about sort of how he uh, um, uh, responded after his uh, fleets were lost in a storm. So this is what Suetonius says. Some censured an act and saying of his, declaring when he, that when his fleets were lost in the storm, he cried out, I will have the victory, spite of Neptune. And that on the day when games in the circus next occurred, he removed the statue of the god from the sacred procession. Now, this is a, a bit of an interesting story. So when you lose some ships in a storm in the ancient world, you would say, yes, probably the god of the sea, uh, that is the Latin uh, god Neptune. This would be the Greek Poseidon uh, in the Latin conceptual verb, uh, uh, was responsible for it. But Augustus here sort of defies the gods. He says, I will have the victory spite of Neptune, uh, implying that he will essentially uh, make a claim to be stronger than the god of the sea. Some could say that's uh, pushing his luck. Uh, and then in what, uh, in my household at least, would be described a bit of as a tantrum. tantrum uh, what he does that the next time there is a celebration in Rome, he takes the god, the, the god Neptune statue, and he removes that statue from a sacred procession. It's really like he's having a hissy fit. Uh, and uh, is trying to take revenge. Now, um, better today, we might look back at this story and think that Neptune, of course, is a, a concept rather than a, a real power in the ancient world. In the ancient world, people do think Neptune uh, is uh, uh, a god. And uh, so this is showing uh, some kind of defiance of uh, the traditional religious order of uh, Rome. And the whole story overall, uh, in sections 13 and 16, suggests that Augustus was in fact uh, far from uh, sort of the great military leader, uh, but instead he was someone who relied on the help of his uh, comrades such as Marcus Agrippa, and also someone who didn't take it very well when he lost uh, uh, a battle. And we have already uh, heard of the other story, which is also listed in Suetonius, that after his, uh, some legions were lost in Germany, he says, Varus, Varus, what did you do with my legions? Again, showing a, an almost childish response to uh, uh, the difficulties he was encountering. Now, another claim uh, that the Res Gestae makes is uh, uh, concerning veterans. So, uh, uh, Augustus said about half a million Roman citizens were under military oath to me. That would mean that they are ready to serve as soldiers. Of these, when their terms of service were ended, I settled in colonies or sent back to their own municipalities a little more than 300,000. And to all of these, I allotted lands or granted money as rewards for military service. So what's happening here is that, of course, uh, when you have a civil war, uh, a large percentage of the population would be involved in the fighting. And what Augustus claims is that essentially he, he 
provided a way of living for more than half of those uh, uh, who vote for him, right? Uh, and that uh, they were given uh, uh, land or money at the end of their service. Now, overall, I think this is not uh, a bad representation of how um, Augustus did try to pacify a, a large empire in which people were used to uh, getting things done by weaponry. Uh, it is in fact the case that he settled quite a few of these veterans. But nevertheless, from Suetonius, we get this uh, uh, little detail that maybe it didn't go down quite so beautifully in real life. And that's always good for us to remember, you know, is that sort of later versions of stories just give us sort of the ultimate positive outcome, but they might not uh, be able to offer uh, sort of how controversial an issue might have been back when it was actually enacted. So this is what Suetonius has to say in section 13. He could satisfy neither the veterans nor the landowners, for the latter complained that they were being pushed off their land, and the former that they were not being given the treatment their good service had deserved. So we see here that, in fact, uh, when he was making these moves, they were quite controversial, right? The veterans are upset, they feel like they're not getting enough, and uh, the landowners are uh, upset because um, uh, they feel that they are losing their land, probably. Uh, they were using some land that maybe they were not supposed to use, or maybe they just couldn't prove that it was their land. But it seems that people lost land in the process of uh, uh, these uh, settlements. Let us now turn to clemency, which is such an interesting uh, uh, problem in terms of, uh, it was a big claim of Julius Caesar, as you might recall. Uh, and so it was something that Augustus sort of cautiously embraced, uh, we could say. So this is what he uh, said about it. I waged many wars throughout the whole world, by land and by sea, both civil and foreign. And when victorious, I spared all citizens who sought pardon. Ah, that sounds very nice. Foreign peoples who could safely be pardoned, I preferred to spare rather than to extirpate, meaning I was, uh, um, I didn't want to kill all enemies, but instead if they could be pacified, that's what I did. So again, sounds like he is incredibly nice. Now Suetonius again uh, shows us a different side of uh, uh, Augustus. So in section 13, he was not restrained in victory, but sent the head of Brutus to Rome to be thrown at the foot of Caesar's statue and was savage in his treatment of the most prominent captives, not even sparing them insulting language. Okay, so sending Brutus's uh, hand to, to be thrown at the foot of Caesar's statue in a way is of course a very good way to let everyone know that Augustus was uh, meaning when he said he's going to take revenge uh, on his father, but it shows us also uh, a lack of clemency, a lack of respect for a dead enemy. Uh, a lack of uh, 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 appreciation of uh, other political views. Um, now we hear even further about how he treats people who were on the opposing side and who lost after he became victorious. So it's about a captive, the story continues. When one backed him piteously for burial, he is said to have replied that the birds would decide. That's, uh, as we would say today, rather cold. Uh, he, uh, somebody wants to make sure they are buried, right? It's a sort of uh, basic respect for a dead body. And he said the birds would decide, suggesting that he would let the birds pick on the body. Uh, again, not nice, really not nice. And definitely not something we would describe with the word clemency, by the way, which is a completely Latin word, clementia, right? It's the uh, ancient equivalent. Now let's see uh, this ultimate uh, 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 one, then uh, two other captives come up, a father and a son. So they backed for their lives. Uh, so when they backed for their lives, they say he ordered them to draw lots or play Mora, which is like an ancient sort of uh, 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 luck game, to determine which of them should have his own life spared, and watch them both die, for when the father, who had offered to be the one to die, was killed, he then made the son take his own life too. Right? So he actually even lies in the process and makes his family member watch each other die and the father offers to die so that the son survives and then he still has the son killed. So again, not the clemency I had in mind. Uh, the last bit for this first section is his uh, sense of uh, popularity, right? Res gestae presentation, Augustus, super popular. 
the whole of Italy voluntarily took an oath of allegiance to me and demanded me as its leader in the war in which I was victorious at Actium, right? So everybody wanted me to be uh, the leader and protect him. So let's look at this uh, um, uh, section on popularity uh, from Svetonius. Uh, leaving Actium, he moved on to winter quarters at Samos, where he received the disturbing news that the troops whom, after the victory, he had selected from all the army divisions and sent on ahead to Brundisium were mutinying, demanding booty, and their uh, just discharge. So again, it shows us this sort of sense that these soldiers who supposedly were so eager to fight for him, maybe they were just not quite. So. Um, as the first part of the lecture, uh, first lecture of lesson 26 concludes, we can tell that there is other evidence that sort of goes against what Augustus presented about himself, and Suetonius is often a good place to find out. I will pick up the same story in the next lecture. <laughs>